Hello and welcome to Taylor Talks Comics. Today we're going to talk about Daredevil Omnibus Volume 1, The Silver Age with the Man Without Fear. Stay tuned. Okay, thank you for joining me. This is Omnibus Volume 1, um, collecting the earliest adventures of Daredevil, The Man Without Fear. I wanted to go over this omnibus because I am currently going through a big Daredevil readathon. I do have um, uh, Volume 2 upstairs because I'm reading that one, and then we have Volume 3 that just came out. So I wanted to go over Silver Age Daredevil. Um, and talk about some maybe misconceptions of how the quality is. Because I feel like this is an underrated run. This was a beat up copy of volume one. Um, if you're looking for this, it is out of print at this time. I think it will come back into print. I'd be shocked if it didn't. Daredevil gets a lot of love in the omnibus game from Marvel. But I bring that up because I bought this right when volume one, when I noticed volume one was going out of print. And they announced that volume two was going to be printed is when I finally bought this, I broke down. I got a good deal for this on eBay because it wasn't out of print yet and people were selling this for a pretty low price at the time. Um, but I got a pretty beat up copy of it and you can see by the dust jacket, it's kind of wrinkly a little bit. Um, but if I can get a good deal on it, I'm willing to um, do that if the structure of the book is okay and it's not like falling apart. And you can see it is, it's been well read before I, even I got a hold of it. But the structure is there. It still reads good. It's kind of loosey goosey a little bit because it's been read so much, but I have no problems with this. Um, but what this does collect though is Daredevil 1 through 41, annual number one in the Fantastic Four 73, which is a classic Jack Kirby Stan, Stan Lee era Fantastic Four. This is your classic Silver Age omnibus of Marvel if you're familiar with what they do, um, the great team of, of Marvel does. And then you'll know this is the old marbled marbled not marvel marbled design that they did with this like with these end papers and <clears throat> it says here comes daredevil man without fear omnibus this is like in between it was like the they did like the faux leather design and now they just do the plain black if this ever gets reprinted i'm assuming it will it'll have the small font we know that right and then also on the back it'll probably have the daredevil logo um but here's the front title sheet you get all the creators in here as well um then you get the credits with which issues they all worked on so stanley wrote every issue in this book with the exception of issue number 10 wally wood wrote that one and Daniel o'neill wrote issue 18 um, under a pseudonym pencilers we get bill Everett on number one joe orlando on two to four wally wood five through ten john ramita 12 through 19 and then gene colon starts his run and he would last like not consecutive because there would be some issues here and there that are off um but he would do over 80 issues of daredevil starting his iconic run in this omnibus then you get the table of contents with which issue starts on which page the month and year that each issue came out with and the title of each issue amazing table of contents i always love a good table of contents it makes it easy to go back and forth and figure out who's working on which issue you know, where certain issues happen and that kind of thing. And this is collected as, I think, three Marvel Masterworks. Let me see here. You can always tell by the different introductions. So one, two, three. Yeah. So what they basically did with a lot of these Silver Age books, not all of them, but a lot of these Silver Age omnibuses, what they'll do is take three or four of the Marvel Masterworks and lump them together into one collection. So this is basically three Marvel Masterworks, the content of three Marvel Masterworks that they combined together, made it oversized, and threw it in one book. With that, you get all the introductions that happened in the Marvel Masterworks. So it starts off with the Red Letter Day by Stan Lee. He wrote this in 1991, when the first volume of the Daredevil Masterworks came out. The next one is... Oh, I'm wrong. There's four. Okay. Survive and Triumph. So this has four Marvel Masterworks in it. 
266. All right. Then you get the, what would be the second volume of Marvel Masterworks in place of where those issues took place. So like, this is like the first volume of Marvel Masterworks and you start the second volume. Does that make sense? Everybody understand what I'm saying? And you get to the start. <clears throat> now, one thing I want to say is that Daredevil, many people say, don't, if you want to read early Daredevil, start with Frank Miller. Don't bother with the Silver Age stuff. Now, I love Frank Miller's Daredevil. I've read that run multiple times when I was in middle school, high school. Um, my library didn't have a lot of comics. But for some reason, one of the things they had was all of the Frank Miller run in those uh, Frank Miller Visionaries Daredevil trade paperbacks. So I checked them out multiple times at the library. I've read it multiple times, and I loved it. Nothing wrong with starting at Frank Miller. But don't just immediately dismiss the Silver Age era. as Because some people will say, like, oh, that's hokey. You can see Daredevil's in the yellow costume. It's hokey Silver Age stuff. It's Frank Miller takes it to serious, dark and gritty crime you know, neo-noir, or not neo-noir, just crime-noir storytelling. Before that, it's just kind of hokey-jokey Daredevil. That's not necessarily true. You do see him fighting more outlandish superheroes in their outlandish costumes, like Electro here. I always find that stuff charming. I love Silver Age comics. Um, the Purple Man is in this one. Um, but you do see little bits of the crime story, noir kind of... Um, throughout this early run this does collect all the letters pages which i always love it's where you can read the uh, context of what people were thinking about this story in real time when these issues were actually coming out here's the first wally wood issue and this was a big deal wally wood was one of the great artists of the ec comics um day with his sci-fi stories he even did mad magazine he could draw in so many different styles. Um, and he was coming to Marvel, and this was a big deal. Stan Lee thought it was a big deal. as one of the biggest name artists from the outside coming in to work for Marvel. Now, I don't want to... Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that issues two through four were done by Joe Orlando, who also worked with EC Comics. But Wally Wood coming in was a big deal. They even... Um, let me see here. Trying to see if they made a big announcement about it beforehand. Yeah, I don't know if they did or not. But regardless, they got this big this special cover treatment. Which, I mean, Jack Kirby wasn't even getting this when he worked with Marvel. But let me move the camera down a little bit so we can get it closer here. It says, under the brilliant artistic craftsmanship of famous illustrator Wally Wood, Daredevil reaches new heights of glory. The idea at this time was to bring Wally Wood in to be a full-time bullpinner at Marvel. That was the idea. <laughs> it didn't turn out that way. Um, but here's a personal note. Uh, Stanley saying, thank you, Bill Everett, Joe Orlando, Vince Coletta, for all that you did, but Wally Wood is here now, and he's here to stay. So again, the Matador character obviously looks kind of hokey, um, but this is brilliant Wally Wood illustrating. Still different, different panel layouts than you've gotten in any other more Marvel comic at this time, um, different ways of just like storytelling with these little captions, something that you'd see in EC comics, but not necessarily Marvel comics. So it's, it felt like a different comic all of a sudden, and there was a great response to it. But the issue came behind the scenes. Um, here's a great pinup, which I think was done by Wally Wood. There's no name on it though. Um, Behind the scenes, because Wally Wood would then do this issue, introducing the uh, Mr. Fear, I think his name is. I forget his name. I think it's Mr. Fear, because he shows up later in Volume 2 of the Omnibus that I just read. Um, so again, you get more Wally Wood, kind of working with sci-fi too, kind of EC-inspired. Um, not even EC-inspired artwork, just artwork that you would see in EC Comics brought over to the table of Marvel. And then this would all come and lead to this, which is issue number seven, one of the greatest issues of Daredevil of all time. Um, this is where the red costume is introduced. So the yellow costume, people are making fun of it, saying it's hokey, whatever. That only lasted six issues because Wally Wood would then introduce this all red costume for Daredevil, 
with these this great drawn issue like it looks like some collage techniques were written, drawn in the back there i don't are used in the back but namor is the big fight here which i love namor he's one of my favorite marvel characters so seeing that look at that lettering there with namor busting through the bowl namor's such a badass i don't know if people hate on him or whatever but he's so just tough <laughs> like i love seeing him in in fist fights but yeah him, he's fighting daredevil in this issue I love this treatment here too. It almost looks like a what like Ed Piscord used in like X Men Grand Design. If this is done on yellowed paper, but that stayed white, it'd really pop out of there with the electrocuting him. The Namor and, and Daredevil. You can see Daredevil's beat up. That looks very like what something you'd see in the Frank Miller era, right? And here's Stilt Man. Um, Wally would do this issue, and then I think it's issue. Oh, here's a cool piece of by Lollywood showing how the Billy Club of Daredevil works. And then how the inside of his apartment's laid out with his gym and all the other pe uh, rooms and stuff that he has. So he can hide his gym so people don't see why would this blind lawyer have this very advanced gym. Just like all these little sound mo movements too that Lollywood is so different looking than any other Marvel comic. Um... Is it Wally Wood's best stuff? I, I don't know. I think his sci-fi stuff from EC era is probably the, his best stuff, but this is still amazing. Even at the era of Marvel pop art productions, where I think Stan even writes a piece in here. I forget what it is. Where he writes, we're not calling them Marvel comics anymore. They're Marvel pop art productions. That only lasted a few months. It didn't last much longer than that. Yeah, so then here's issue nine. It's The next issue is when Wally Wood starts his um conflicts with marvel because uh the marvel method back then was done where marvel would, or sorry stanley would have a meeting with the artist and go over a kind of a a paragraph an outline of like okay this story daredevil's gonna fight mr fear and then he's gonna capture karen page and kidnap her and then um, they're gonna get out by daredevil rescuing her or something like something small quick and quick and dirty kind of um treatment like that it was then the artist idea or the artist job to do all of the page layouts. They would take that outline and they'd lay out the entire story panel for panel, just leaving out the word balloons. And then Stan would go in and fill in the word balloons. That was the Marvel method. It, it was uh, Stan Lee would always say in his history, he did it so he can keep his artist working. He couldn't sit down and write because he was the main writer for Marvel throughout this period. Um, almost exclusively him, and then sometimes it'd be like Larry Lee would write some issues. It wasn't until Roy Tom Thomas joined in that Stan kind of took a back seat on the writing. So he said he couldn't keep up writing all these issues. He would just give these artists different outlines, and then he'd fill them in later. Um, and it would give, he would say then it would lead to the artist drawing these action packed kind of scenes because that's what they leaned heavy on, and then Stan could incorporate his dialogue afterwards. With all that said, Wally Wood's issue was that. He said if he's laying out all the pages, that makes him a co-writer at, at minimum, if not the writer, because he's writing the story. Um, we'd see certain things like this later with credits like layouts by or story by, written by kind of things. Um, <clears throat> those didn't exist back then. So Wally would kind of demand it to Stan. And he's like, starting with issue 10, I want to be the writer for it. So see that in the credits. You'll say exquisite editing by Stan Lee. Illustrious layouts by Bob Powell, stunning script and art by Wally Wood. So Bob Powell did the layouts, but Wally Wood wrote it and drew everything. And this was his story they came up with. And Stan even kind of gives him some uh, flack about it too. Um, not in the issue before, but he'll say, two great surprises await you, this offbeat issue. So he's already calling it an offbeat issue. So he's kind of throwing shade towards Wally Wood about this whole endeavor. Um, Daredevil's first real mystery thriller. Two, Wally Wood has always wanted to try his hand at writing a story as well as drawing it. And Big Hearted Stan, who wanted to rest anyways, uh, said okay. So what follows next is anybody's guess. You may like it or not, but you can be sure of this. It's going to be different. So it's almost like he's like already saying like if, if it's a crap story, um, it's at least going to be different. Kind of like he's almost like throwing shade at Wally from the get-go. Kind of... Uh, it's like when a, an MMA fighter's entering a fight, he's already come up with this excuse as why he's going to lose before the fight even happens. 
He's like, well, my, my knee's been hurting before the fight, so just in case I lose, like, that, that might be why. Here's, like, the hideout, because th this whole story is about the, uh, the organizer and how he has the, um, what's the group called? It's like the Minnes ever you can figure out. It's this group right here, which are all hokey costumes, but I absolutely love them. I wish these villains would still be around today. I don't know if they've been any more modern Daredevil runs, but those are classic superhero villains. I want, I love superhero comics like that. Because you can still have a serious crime noir story with crazy stories like that. And then it says, well, if you've seen a more complicated, mixed up, madcap mystery yarn than this one, you've got us beat by a mile. Now here's the payoff. Wonderful Wally decided that he doesn't have time to write the conclusion next ish, and he's forgotten most of the answers we'll be needing. So Sorrowful Stan has inherited the job of job of trying to tying the whole yarn together and finding a way to make it all come out in the wash. And you think you've got troubles. So now he's like, for whatever reason, I think Wally Woods just decided he's leaving Marvel. He doesn't want to he's kind of on his way out. He does a does he do the art or just the inking on the next issue? Yeah, he just has the inky on the next one. Uh, Bob Powell is, is a penciler. So he's already on his way out of Marvel. He do, does a couple issues of inking them, and then he's gone. Um, and f so that was like kind of split after issue 10. And Stan's already like throwing shade, saying, like, who's going to make sense of this issue? And uh, I think, is there even another piece here? Wally Wood wrote part one of this two-parter last ish, just for a lark. But now it's up to sly old Stan to put together pieces together, and make it come out okay in the end. Can he do it? See for yourself. Just constant shade at Wally Wood, which is a it is a trap. Like <laughs> Wally Wood is one of the all-time great comic book artists. So I don't know. I really wish it would have worked out. It would have been great to see this long run of Wally Wood on Daredevil or working for Marvel. Um, I because there was a time like during on Nick Fury, Jim Stranko was writing and drawing those issues. Uh, it's something that Jack Kirby always wanted as well. So it, it did kind of rub Jack Kirby wrong the wrong way during this whole endeavor with Wally Wood as well. Um, Wally Wood was something that, somebody that Jack Kirby worked with. Um, Wally Wood inked Jack Kirby on um, the... Uh, what's it called? Of the Space Force? Sky Masters of the Space Force. That new sleeper strip. Um, so Jack Kirby does the layouts for issue 12. But then John Romita is the artist. So John Romita, who, uh, John Romita Sr. is who we're talking about, had the uh, big long run on Spider-Man following uh, Steve Ditko. Before that is when this Daredevil run where he lasts seven issues. And John Romita Sr. had a long history of doing these romance comics in the Golden Age prior to Marvel Silver Age. And that's what really spices up his run of these seven issues, especially with the Karen Page, Foggy... Nelson, um, Daredevil, Matt Murdock kind of love triangle. He does have Kazar, and I would say this Kazar trilogy of issues, I don't know. I wasn't a big fan of the Kazar stuff. It's kind of dragging down a little bit. Um, but you do get these great John Romita issues. But what I want to bring to Foggy Nelson, this is an image too. <laughs> I want to point this out. Foggy Nelson wearing a uh, Daredevil costume. Because at one point he's trying to convince everyone that he was Daredevil so that Karen Page would fall in love with him. Kind of you know, insane. But this image too, with, with this kind of frumpy looking, uh, um, Foggy Nelson in the costume looks so much similar, so similar to the night owl in Watchmen, does it not? Where he's like that over kind of overweight, middle-aged out of shape kind of guy. The image just seemed like, I bet you Alan Moore read this comic and it really, you know, influenced him from there. I'm trying to find issue 20. Because that is when it really gets going. That's 22. Sorry. You can kind of see where the covers are. Okay. So, John Romita leaves issue 19 and he goes to Spider-Man. This is when Silver Age Daredevil, Bronze Age Daredevil needs to be read. The first 19 issues, there's interesting stuff there. There's the Wollywood... Um, five issue run with all the drama there and seeing Wally Wood's great layouts. Um, the Joe Orlando issues in two through four, are, you know, they're very great. I love Joe, Joe Orlando's artwork. Bill Everett does a great job at issue number one. The John Romita stuff is is good too from issues twelve through nineteen. Uh, seeing his work and what would go on to be his Spider-Man run. 
But starting with issue 20, you get Gene Colan on the art duties. And Gene Colan is an absolute master of artwork. And this is his defining run. He does do Tomb of Dracula for a very long issue. I think that's kind of his magnum opus. But this is what really took Gene Colan and put him on the map, in my opinion. He did a lot of work in the golden age of um, with Atlas Comics before Marvel became Marvel Comics. But nothing like that I feel like made Gene Colan a household name. And I think a lot of it has to do with his page layouts. He starts working with these big giant panels. Um, and doing Marvel Method, you can do this. And then also using the giant panels gives Stan Lee less room to fill in his dialogue. He really tries here and there. Um, but as it keeps going, you get less and less dialogue of that Silver Age stuff that people say kind of holds him down away and holds him back from reading Silver Age comics because they're so dialogue heavy or, you know, exposition heavy. Um, but like there's all, kind, all kinds of splash pages throughout Gene Colan's run. I want to get a little bit deeper into here. Because he really gets really inventive with the panel layouts and it might be in volume two. Oh, they do introduce Mike Murdoch. I, I do have to talk about him. Um, I don't know when he gets introduced at all, but Mike Murdoch is Matt Murdoch's fictional twin brother. He's goofy, he's outlandish, he's over the top, the complete opposite of Matt Murdoch in personality. And the reason why Matt Murdoch invents him, invents this idea that he has his twin brother is to explain, because there's at some point someone outs Matt Murdoch as the daredevil. And then Matt, his way of pulling the wool over Foggy and Karen Page's eyes is saying, no, it's not me. It's actually Matt or Mike Murdoch. And Foggy's even like, we were college roommates together. You never had a twin brother. And he's like, yeah, we're, we've been, a, you know, we haven't talked in a number of years and I don't like to talk about him. Well, he gets introduced as a character. And then all of a sudden you have a love, not a love triangle, but a love square, I guess, because it's Matt Murdoch, Mike Murdoch, Foggy Nelson, and Karen Page. Karen Page is constantly talking about how she loves all three of them and she can see herself marrying all any of the three and they have to kind of um, put it into that but that complicates matt's life and daredevil's life because now he has not only daredevil's alter ego but he has this matt this mike burdock character as an alter ego and it, it sounds really hokey and really cheesy but they handle it in the best way like they do kind of explain why you never see matt matt and mike in the same room together like they explain it to foggy and karen i mean not the reader because the reader understands they're not the same person. Or they are the same person, sorry. Um, but they need, like, you sort of get these great covers, too, by Gene Colan. One thing I've noticed, too, um, is how great he is as a cover artist. And, again, like, these crime, like, you want that crime noir storytelling? You get that with Gene Colan. Gene Colan, who worked in, um, like I said, the Atlas era crime comics, but also he would later do a lot of comics for the... Um, eerie and creepy comics the worn magazines like he can work in that style and also the romance era stuff like he definitely can do the romance issues or scenes too with karen page and whatnot gene colin drawing uh thor mike murdoch dressing up as thor <laughs> crazy stuff crazy stuff but i love it i love all this silver age stuff it's also charming and funny but it's such a quick read i read this omnibus over just a, a few days Really, and I'm already halfway through volume two, um, which continues Gene Colan's run, which I'll do a separate video on. Um, oh, here's the King Size Special, the annual. And it's all brand new. There's no, because a lot of the annuals would have like uh, reprinted stories in there or whatnot. But this was a whole new story, the whole, all 39 pages. Which Gladiator is such a, a, a badass villain too. It looks like something from a Mad Max movie. <clears throat> this great Gene Colan artwork. Stilt Man. Again, these great giant splash pages. Something that is not synonymous with Silver Age comics. Uh, you think of like six panel grids or nine panel grids. Um, but Gene Colan really played around with a lot of that. These pinups of Karen Page dreaming about her and her and uh, is that Matt or Mike? I think Matt. Uh, Matt. And then here's Foggy Nelson thinking about Matt, and he really hates Mike Murdoch. He thinks he's, he's an idiot. And Karen Kazar pinup, and here's Daredevil pinup. 
Gladiator, Leapfrog, The Mass Marauder, Owl. Oh, this is a great issue too. Here's a stroke of midnight. This is a, a behind the scenes drama of Gene Colan going to Stan Lee's house to draw, to write an issue of Daredevil. And I love these kind of behind the scenes. I'd, I'd almost re read a whole collection of these because Marvel will do some of these from time to time. And that's Stan Lee pre uh, toupee, pre mustache. And then here is Gene Colan. Again, still on artwork here. Oh, there's the Doctor Doom stories in this omnibus. See, I'm trying to trying to separate them too because I've been reading issue or omnibus volume two, and I don't want to mix what's going on in here. Yeah, you get a Daredevil with the Fantastic Four in this crossover story. So you get Gene Colan drawing Marvel's first family. And it's like, don't look now, but Doctor Doom is here. And then, um, trying to see. Here's this great cover. So Daredevil's kept in a prison with Doctor Doom. At one point, Doctor Doom and him switch bodies. That looks like a Kirby-esque splash page there. So then you have Matt Murdock, Mike Murdock, Daredevil, Doctor Doom, like all kind of mixing and switching personalities. He has all these alter egos that he's dealing with. Um, and then here's the uh, Fantastic Four crossover issue. Fantastic Four 73. Uh, this is drawn by Jack Kirby. We get Thor in this issue as well. So you get Fantastic Four, you get Thor, you get Daredevil, all mixed into the same issue. And then the Fallen Hero, it's issue 41. I'm trying to get to the last issue here. And that's the not brand Eck issue. Where am I missing it here? Do, do, do. Bear with me. Okay, that's what I want to talk about. So issue 41 is the death of Mike Murdoch. So Matt Murdoch is fed up with all the alter egos, dealing with all the uh, curtailing and whatnot. So he has to kill Mike Murdoch. So he can, conceives a way of where he's going to kill Mike Murdoch and Foggy and Karen will witness it. But also, they think they know Mike Murdock is Daredevil. That's what they know in their in their knowledge. So they know if Mike Murdock dies, that means Daredevil's dead. Um, and they don't let that secret be known to the public. Like the public doesn't know that Mike Murdock is Daredevil. It's just those two. So that's kind of a spin and, and twist in the story as well. And that's what kicks off the next volume, which I'll do a different video on when I get done reading that. Here's Gene Colan doing a cartoony style for Not Brain Eck, which was Marvel's kind of paired. It's like their Mad Magazine but it was all parodying different Marvel stories. So you get to see Gene Colan working in like this cartoony style, which is fun. And here's all the back matter, which is, there's quite a bit of back matter in this omnibus, which is really cool. Let me see here. You get some Bill Effort original pages. Here's a house ad, um, which is advertising Daredevil, but also advertising Stan Lee's You Don't Say um, album, which was 100 pages, it looks like, um, of these different images from newspapers that Stanley would write these funny captions on top of. This had to be pulled off the shelves, though, because it was due to be released in November of 1963. Well, um, if you know history, you know that JFK was murdered, assassinated on November 11th, 1963. So they had to pull that off the shelves and never release it. Not that he was making fun of JFK, but he just didn't want that kind of comedy and brev brevity or levity. Levity, that's what I was thinking of. Um, brought to JFK after he had just been assassinated because it, it rocked the nation. Um, here's Wally Wood doing these uh, reference sheets, which is amazing. To see this kind of behind the scenes of all the characters, making sure he draws Karen Page shorter than everybody else. Here's a t-shirt design by Jack Kirby and Frank Giacoya, I guess. I would love to have that t-shirt, though. I need to find a way to make that. Here's Wally Wood breaking down the Billy Cub Club before he did that panel that I showed you. Here's some sketches from people. Jack Kirby skit layouts. Oh yeah, the Jack Kirby layouts that he did. So he did the layouts for, I think, three issues for John Romita. Um, so you can kind of see what his layouts look like. And you can go back and compare it to the... Uh, well, these are unused layouts, actually. Okay, never mind. I was going to say you can compare them to the full pages, but I guess you can't. Uh, there's a house ad. John Romita, John Romita original art. Here's Gene Cole in original art.
And then here's the uh, where these stories were reprinted in these other issues. Marvel would have these reprint issues that would collect a bunch of different stories back in the day. But these are great great to track down because you're never going to be able to find like Daredevil number one, like the original issue. But you might find a um, 1970s era reprint of Daredevil number one, that story, which is still on that yellow newsprint paper that's so magnificent. Um, you can still find that and it'll be affordable. This is a, uh, these are trade paperback covers that they used where they used old art but re recolored it. And here's the Alex Ross cover that was on the dust jacket. So it's Daredevil Omnibus Volume 1. Highly recommend it, um, especially when you get to the Gene Colon era. Um, let me know in the comments if you agree or if you've read any of this or if this has inspired you to read any of this. Um, and give the video a thumbs up. Like and subscribe, all that jazz. Comment down below. I love talking com comics, so if you start a conversation down below, I will comment and reply. And then also I have uh, promo codes at organicpricebooks.com where you can buy comics like these, books like these. That's all, all that information is down below in the description. Thank you guys. Keep reading comics.